Ladies and gents, welcome to CG Reaction, and this is Unbiased History: The Five Good Emperors by the channel Dover Hetty. So, in the last video, Pax Romana, and also video before that, the Mad Emperors, we saw how people were just killing each other left and right to become emperors, power-hungry people who didn't last long. And uh, one guy comes, he dies. Another guy comes, another one dies. It was just too unstable like that. Uh, Eastern governors had enough. Uh, you know, Vespasian and the Flavian dynasty, you know, intervene and became emperor. They were more stable. Uh, they did, uh, you know, lots of progress and in Rome, uh, built colosseums. So, you know, uh, it it went stable for a bit, and then obviously. Obviously, like always, more conspiracies, more backstabbing, even they died. So now this is the episode of the five good emperors. Apparently, there are going to be five new emperors who's going to be good. Who's gonna, you know, bring stability and give, build progress. And I thought after the five in dynasties, it's gonna be downhill. But I didn't know the five good emperors, they're still left. I know the last one is Commodus. After that, everything just went downhill. I know that because of the movie Gladiator. But yeah. Uh, let's watch this episode and remember people if you like Barry XM don't forget to like and subscribe and show support to this channel it will tell me which type of videos to react to more and if you want me to react to any video comment down alright let's watch this video The Flavian dynasty was shattered. By the end of the first century, thanks to the Senate, the Roman Empire stood once again at the precipice of civil war. The senators were quick to start shilling for their own favorites to take over power, but having assassinated such a competent and beloved emperor, none such vermin would do. Indeed, there was only one man they could elevate that was both competent, respected, and not feared. Nerva, by then very old and childless. Suddenly burdened with the empire, Nervous sought to restore order by pleasing the petty senators, allowing them to desecrate the Domitian statues and squabble freely among themselves, as he set about simultaneously reducing taxes and keeping the plebs entertained, with the help of Domitian's administrative staff that is, even cancelling a tax the Jews had to pay so they wouldn't feel like revolting. But in his pursuit to please the senatorial parasites, he allowed the mission. I understand that, you know, in the past, emperors just died left and right. Flavian dynasty, I mean, when they died, uh, you know, so they're like, you know what, there is two backstabbing going on at the same time as the Jews revolt. We can't have that, especially um, more than a million Jews died, uh, you know, by the Flavian dynasty. Last episode, we saw that. So, you know, he's like, you know, Jews revolting right now would be a bit too much. So that's why he was just keeping things, you know, down key, I guess. Those assassins to evade punishment, something Domitian's Praetorian Guard couldn't abide by. One night, the Praetorians invaded the Imperial Palace, slaughtered the local guards and ran a long-delayed massive purge on all of Domitian's assassins. Nerva was taken hostage during all this. The video just started and again, backstabbing continues. Does anybody respect anything, any chain of command? Does everybody just take things into their own hands? Damn. So far, the only thing I understood is past few episodes like Caesar, Augustus, all these people were just stable, but after just some time, everybody just killing each other left and right is just stupid. But never harmed. In fact, they just let him go, and he thanked them afterwards. 
everyone agreed a purge was needed. But old Nerva's days were counted either way. Nearing his death, Nerva cemented his reputation as the first of the five good emperors by performing the greatest action possible, adopting Trajan as his heir. Damn, the senators there he goes. were quick to start bitching, being denied their chance to lobby for their favorite vermin to become emperor. All while Trajan governed Lower Germania, scaring the germs away with his mere. People are saying Trajan is uh, was really great, and he's sound really great in this episode. So I guess Trajan is coming. He's gonna be even more dominant, huh? I didn't know that was possible. The presence. It was then that he received a messenger from Rome, bearing news of his adoption by Nerva. The messenger's name? Hadrian. They were second degree cousins, you see. Both descended from Roman colonists in Hispania, born in Italica, a city founded by Scipio Africanus himself to host his veterans. Trajan's own father had served beside Vespasian and Titus in Judea, while the young genius trained in Syria, and just like Caesar, instigated an aura of respect and reverence wherever he went. Once Hadrian's father died, his cousin Trajan, alongside a man named Atianus, took responsibility for Hadrian and his sister, raising them as the children he never had. For while Trajan did get married with a virtuous wife, he much enjoyed boy pussy instead. Hadrian, however, was so obsessed with twin cats. Alright, another emperor who's gay. What was it about that emperor's man? All of them were gay. I mean, uh, the chance of someone being gay is not that high, so what was happening there? That he gained the title Greekling, embracing his duty as a Trojan descendant and civilizing all twink Greekoids he found with his massive Roman dick. And while the Spaniard cousins traveled south, Nerva got so tired of dealing with the Senate's shit that he suffered a stroke. Being taken to his villa, he later developed a fever, dying shortly after. And as Trajan traversed the Limes Germanicus, having been informed of Nerva's death, he finished his boarding spot. So all Nerva did was just make Trajan his heir, that's it, that was his big thing. Damn, if just naming your heir someone is a big thing, how big Trajan is going to be? Factions ...and set off for Rome. It's often hard to realize the importance of the times one lives in, but while few knew it at the time, as Trajan entered Roman foot, they were about to experience the height of Roman civilization. As Trajan approached the Senate, he was very respectful, emulating Augustus's benevolence to keep the treacherous senators in line, continuing Nerva's policy to placate them, including just as much bread and circuses for the masses. One of Trajan's countless skills was his ability to recognize talent, assembling the best of the best the Empire could offer, sending them to govern the provinces and legions with great autonomy. One such brilliant mind was Apollodorus of Damascus, the genius engineer he met while in Syria, whom Hadrian would always fangirl around, and Lucius Quietus, See, for me, that's why Trajan is one of the best emperor of all time. Any emperor, any leader understands, you know, science and technology as the key thing and, you know, promotes it that way. To me, he's just a winner. It doesn't matter what Romans did, doesn't matter how strong they were. To me, Romans are only big because of whatever they left behind, all the, all the technological advance there was, all the architecturally great there was. So science and technology only thing that matters to me. So whenever some emperor comes and you know promotes science and technology, that's just, yeah. So for me, this thing alone makes Trajan really good. The civilized Berber prince, bringing both along with him wherever he went, including Dacia. As we'll remember, the Cabalus, being a filthy barbarian, betrayed his word, using the funds and weapons given to him to fight. I mean, come on, man, it's not really completely his fault. You know, the Emperor just came there, tried to dominate them, the revolt happens, and he's like, here's the money, defend yourself from the Germans. Of course, he's gonna, you know, stab you in the back. That was gonna happen. ...fortify against the Germans, to instead fortify against the Empire, rallying the local tribes against Rome. Trajan, of course, was revolted by this betrayal and asked the Senate permission to invade, which they unanimously did. But civilizing Dacia would prove to be a one-sided affair, for Trajan would have to defeat a people as well armed as the legions, thanks to their. I feel like you know, regardless of how this uh, you know Dohety how put things here, I'm pretty sure by this point Senate is just you know just for the name. I don't think they have any real power left. I think Emperor does what the Emperor wants. It's just formality to ask senators anything. Iron mines, defending steep mountain forts built with stolen Roman technology, all while enjoying local terrain knowledge and a massive advantage in numbers. Trajan was about to fucking annihilate them. 
having Apollodorus build a temporary bridge, Trajan crossed the Danube, invading with two legionary columns and meeting the Cablus's legions at Tapei. As he relentlessly slaughtered the barbarians, Jupiter sent a powerful storm onto the battlefield, terrifying the Dacians into a retreat. After returning to the Empire to pass the winter, the Cabalus charged out of nowhere, crossing the frozen Danube in a surprise attack, but the ice collapsed on them, submerging his army in the back, while Trajan quickly mobilized a vicious cavalry counterattack in the front, led by Lucius Quietus. Beaten back, and with Trajan's legions threatening to advance further, the Cabalus promptly surrendered. In his infinite mercy, Trajan allowed the Cabalus to remain as client king, only ceding some territory and promising to be loyal this time. As part of the treaty, the Dacians provided the resources for Apollodorus to build a huge permanent bridge across Whoa. the Danube, which would remain the largest one ever built for an Olympic. It's either that or accepting they are slow mutts out loud too. <laughs> Romania, no way. They won't love that hard, will they? <laughs> man, look at the length of that bridge, man. At that time, that's just extraordinary. I love it. Millennium, threatening the Dacians with an immediate imperial response, should they revolt. And of course he revolted again. Not even a year later, he was already sacking Moesha again like the fucking barbarian he was. Utterly pissed, Trajan would invade again, starting the Third Dacian War, to make sure there wouldn't be a fourth. With the military skill born only once in age... I'm surprised how Romans, uh, you know, knowing how dominant they were, knowing how powerful they were since the day one, since the days of the Julius Caesar. How did they left, uh, you know, Germans in here, they, these people, Dacians, alive? I mean, they, they don't, it's not like they, they don't want to kill people. They killed, what, millions of Jews already. So genocide is not that far off for them. So after all this attempt, like, you know, Germans have attacked how many times? Like four or five times? So no emperor went like, this is enough. It's time to purge them completely and just went all the way. Same thing with here, you know, the, the, these people. Uh, and, and the emperors are like, this is the third time they are doing this. I'm gonna kill them all. Maybe it's like, you know, no emperor lasts, lasts long enough to complete anything. They die before they can complete anything. So new emperor comes and it repeats itself, I guess. Trajan, alongside Quietus, crushed all barbarian hordes in his way as he marched to the Dacian capital, laying siege to it. As he did so, a local barbarian betrayed the Cabalus, showing where the water supply of the capital was located. Trajan then cut it off, forcing them to surrender, as the Cabalus cowardly fled towards Sarmatia. Meanwhile, Trajan was informed by another Dacian traitor of where the Cabalus' gold Damn. deposits were, and with this massive gain at his hands, there was only one thing left to do. The Cabalus was later encircled by Trajan's cavalry, and, refusing to pay for his crimes against civilization, he killed himself to avoid capture. Dacia was then broken apart into subservient tribes, with its valuable mines annexed by the Empire. Trajan would then bring the Cabalus' severed- He like, I'll just take the mines, everybody else can fuck off. Head and just right took the mines. To Rome, throwing them at the Gamonian stairs, where Sejanus had once been strangled, and Vitellius beheaded. To celebrate the conquest of Dacia, Trajan held a majestic triumph, bringing to Rome 700 million sesterces worth of gold with him, and another 700 million more every single year from the new province. With these new riches, Trajan would benefit the empire as a whole, proclaiming 123 days of celebration in the Eternal City. After pleasing the plebs, he would have Apollodorus build him a great column to show how Dacia was conquered, Trajan's Column then a forum for the patricians, Trajan's forum, and a market for everyone, Trajan's market, and a road for everyone as well, can you guess? Yes, via Trajana. And when the client king of the Nabatians died, Trajan sent his legions to directly annex it, bringing civilization to Arabia by building a road connecting it to the Red Sea, going through Petra in its route. Yes, the parallels are only going to increase. For the next seven years, Trajan ensured the Roman peace, spending his off time exchanging letters with Pliny the Younger, a good friend of both Tacitus and Suetonius, and assigned the governorship of Bithynia. There, he attested to the emperor's wisdom and virtue, asking him advice on what to do about the Christians. Trajan's advice? Ignore them. For even among the Christ cooks of the future, Trajan would still be universally loved as a virtuous pagan. But while Trajan okay. did everything in his power to make the Pax Romana true to its name, the barbarians of the Far East wouldn't allow him. 
as the king of the Parthians in his arrogance put his own nephew on the throne of Armenia. As the Roman emperor, Trajan had an agreed right to veto this choice, but Vologosius ignored him. Betrayed a second time by barbarian treachery, Trajan gathered his legions face. once more, set on conquering Parthia once and for all. He first started with Armenia, quickly taking over the mountains, putting the king in prison, where he later died, and annexing Armenia as a Roman province, subjugating its surrounding areas as client states. As he did so, a Dacian revolt had broken out, forcing him to send the Syrian governor to go crush it, promoting Hadrian to govern Syria in his place. Only then, with quietus on his side, he launched the invasion of Parthia, conquering city after city in a pincer move attack. As Trajan sailed down the Euphrates conquering cities, he stopped to build a monument, then conquered the Parthian capital, Damn. reaching the Persian Gulf and building a statue for himself to He see. went really deep! No Romans have gone that far. Celebrate, deposing Vologosius and appointing his own client king for Parthia, annexing Mesopotamia as a new Roman province. It was the culmination of countless Roman legacies, from the early forefathers' conquest of Italy, to the Scipio's salting of Carthage, the late Republican subjugation of the Greekoids, to Caesar's conquest of Gaul, and his imperial successor's consolidation of the empire. Trajan had brought the empire to its greatest extent, Look at from that. the North Sea to the Persian Gulf it stretched. The known world had been united under the Roman eagle, its legions invincible, their emperor almighty, his power unmatched, attained by divine right. The first emperor to ever live. All right. Uh, did Roman uh, military had the biggest power around Trajan's time? Or was it around Caesar's time? Or was it around Augustus' time? Obviously, Caesar was the better general. But that's not what I'm talking about. Which time Roman uh, army was uh, one of the most dangerous? Because I feel like it could be around this time. Because around this time, uh, Roman army is already experienced. And Trajan apparently is a really good leader. And he was dominating lots of places. And morale must be high. So I feel like this must be the time where Roman army was the most dangerous uh, time, I guess. Either it's this or, uh, you know, Caesar's time. Because Caesar was such a good general. But I don't know. Up to Augustus. No empire would ever again match Rome's glory. Forevermore, Hitler Trajan would be acclaimed as Optimus Princeps, the best emperor. It's all downhill from here. God. What first got the ball rolling south were the Jews, having migrated to the other eastern provinces. Why does whenever the Jew thing comes, uh, this music plays? What is this music? After their first revolt failed so spectacularly. Wherever the Jews went, they refused to convert to the Roman gods, being shunned away from society at large. Their resentment towards Roman rule culminated in Cyrene, with Lucuas, for he had a theory this Lucuas. The reason why the first Jewish war was lost, Lucuas argued, was that the Jews didn't kill anywhere near enough as many innocent civilians as they should have, and by the gods did he ever put that theory to the test. Proclaiming himself king of asshole Jews killing innocent people for no reason. It's not like their own place was invaded and their own people were killed in millions. Obviously, that didn't happen. And Jews are just killing innocent people left and right. Of the Jews and inciting religious fervor in Cyrene, Lucuas threw another great Jewish revolt. It soon spread all over the east, with him using his forces to persecute and genocide as many civilized Roman civilians as he could. And I do mean genocide. 240,000 killed in Cyprus, 220,000 killed in Cyrene, and Jupiter only knows how many in the other provinces. And after slaughtering the severely outnumbered Roman garrisons, they had the dead's flesh cooked for meat, their skin used for belts, and the survivors thrown to wild beasts. Once the revolt spread to Mesopotamia itself, along with some cities still resisting being civilized and a Parthian revolt breaking out, Trajan oh, no. was forced to turn his forces back. As he put down the troubles <laughs> in Mesopotamia... So Alexander didn't cross to India because of some reason. I haven't watched Alexander series. Trajan didn't cross all the way to India because Jews revolted. Apparently Indians has always been lucky, I guess. Whether Greeks or Romans couldn't you know, reach that place. I mean, obviously, I know, you know, Greek Kingdom did reach one state, few states of India. I'm, I live in one of the states, and I can see there are some architecture here that is inspired by Greek culture, but still didn't completely invade it. 
he sent Lucius Quietus to save the eastern provinces from the Jews, cornering the rebels on Judea, where he crushed them so efficiently that a whole second Jewish war was named after his corrupted name. Back in the front lines, Trajan was dealing with the last pockets of resistance. After pondering the divine beauty of the desert sun a little too much, he suffered a heat stroke. Oh, for God's sake. As he was sake. being taken back to Rome, he urged to write an official letter proclaiming Hadrian as his heir. But his worn down body gave... Oh, no, really? Great Trajan died because of a sunstroke, just because he was out in the sun too much like kids are. <laughs> so out before he had a chance, dying after almost 20 years in power. And what 20 glorious years those were! Now, had Plotina been your standard Roman viper, this is where she would betray the Emperor's wishes. But, as I've mentioned, she was a virtuous one. Keeping Trajan's death a secret, she had an actor mimic his weakened voice, proclaiming Hadrian as his heir, later signing the letter herself. Having led Rome to its greatest heights, from there on, every future Emperor's ascension would be blessed with the words. Felicitur Augusto, Melior Traiano. May he be luckier than Augustus and better than Trajan. All right. Hadrian, Hadrian, Hadrian. Wait a minute, why do I know that name? Oh, isn't this the guy that, you know, Doherty in the previous episode was keep bringing it up with the red eyes that he's gonna kill Jews? Oh my god. So I guess tons of Jews are gonna die in this episode, huh? As Hadrian read about his cousin's death, an unrivaled weight had been put upon him. If the gods would challenge him with living up to the likes of Trajan, then Hadrian, being acclaimed Imperator by his men, would embrace the task head on. Being the fortunate position of governing Syria and all its legions, the senators couldn't bring themselves to bitch too much. They still hated him though. Why? You're asking the wrong questions. What would come to define Hadrian's rule was an immense love of civilization, combined with a deep hatred for barbarity. The result being a preference for highly trained legions, non-stop constructions and consolidated borders, the last one being the first he tackled. For as glorious as Trajan's eastern conquests were, it was left to Hadrian to answer the big question. Was the Middle East worth civilizing? Oh no, gods fucking no. So instead of direct rule, Hadrian recalled Quietus with his legions, settling with having the new provinces made client kings, except those already integrated into the empire. They could stay, for now. But while the senators kept... Ah, now I'm understanding why previous emperors didn't expand that far. Why did he recall them? It's not so easy to govern at far lands uh, more effectively, especially around that time. So that's why the empire wasn't stretching out that far. I mean, look at the Alexander, what he did. Alexander uh, conquered lots of lots of places spanning across everywhere, but he quickly died and all the, all the places just fall apart because you can't govern that much. I mean, it's one thing to conquer, it's one thing to keep it and, you know, governing it. ...their vitriol mostly to themselves, one whom did bitch openly was Atianus. He just wouldn't shut up to Hadrian about needing to purge all of Trajan's former staff members, getting refused every time. So Atianus, directly opposing the Emperor's orders, had the Praetorians murder four ex-consuls who previously served Trajan, including the former governor of Syria and Lucius Quietus. Once he learned of the murders, Hadrian was horrified. Okay, what is the... Uh, what's the mentality here? Why did he want to wanted to kill Trajan's people like that? Hadrian was named heir by Trajan. It wasn't like he took it so he has to erase everything from the previous dynasty or something. He's literally successor of Trajan. Trajan named him his heir. So why did that guy, uh, you know, was constantly telling him to kill Trajan's people? And why didn't he go like, I'm the emperor, shut the hell up and I'm gonna banish you or kill you or something like that? Sometimes I feel like Romans are too lenient, I guess, too forgiving to some people. If they had just killed right people at right times, lots of things would have been different. Right. Immediately kicking Asians out of the Praetorian Guard. Now what's the, the point? the damage was done and so the centaurs began bitching without restraint, ending treason trials and promising not to hurt- Obviously, senators was basically just, you know, uh, they didn't have much power by now, obviously. So they just need as an excuse, I guess. ...them didn't please them. 
so Hadrian turned to the plebs. And to appease them for good, he had all state debts of the past 15 years pardoned. That would do and it. the Praetorians burned the documents in public, making him even more popular than any Flavian. Speaking of whom, if Domitian was a micromanager, then Hadrian was a nanomanager. While Trajan left governance to his capable staff, Hadrian meddled with every single imperial affair, ensuring everything operated efficiently and justly. And to do so, he spent over a half of his reign traveling through the provinces of the empire. First, he headed to the Rhine, disciplining them to prevent another one of their revolts. He was a proper businessman, huh? Personally checked everything, I respect that. Later having them prevent another Germanic incursion by upgrading the walls of the Lyme Germanicus. Which takes us to Britannia, where Hadrian headed north to deal with a recently crushed rebellion, and saw with his own eyes the monstrosities that there lived. Without hesitation, Hadrian ordered a massive wall built, to protect the citizens of Britannia from the horrors that now laid beyond the wall. He then went to his painting. Is there any traces of the wall exist today? But it's all destroyed. Hmm. Yeah. Where he relaxed by hunting down animals and fucking some twinks, then went south to crush a Moorish rebellion, and then went to the east, there negotiating with the Parthians to stabilize the borders. And during his trips, he just kept building shit wherever he felt like. Everywhere, that is. And as he passed by, he renamed the Thracian city as Adrianople in his honor. Yet another thing for you to remember, pleb. That included reconstruction. Alright, so this man literally manage every business, uh, you know, uh, personally. Uh, if you go personally place to place and just manage everything, there are less chance of revolt happening. He just build places. So basically he was creating jobs. <laughs> I respect this guy, man, seriously. I seriously respect this guy. Though, you know, building infrastructures and just, you know, managing everything by himself, the entire empire. That's respectable. Instructions as well. Therefore, rebuilding Agrippa's Pantheon in its current form, and moving the Colossus Solis to stay beside it. Along his trips through the east, he indulged the wildest dreams of every Greek twink he found, until he met the most beautiful of them all, Antinous, who possessed an ass of such quality that even Sporus would kill for it. In such a good mood would Antinous put Hadrian, that while in Greece, he allowed the Greek hordes to assemble themselves into a pan-Hellenic league led by Athens and Sparta only for it to be broken apart by petty squabbling, as Hadrian both reassured Rome's authority over its client kings and indulged in the weird religion the Greeks had so shamefully copied from Troy. Afterward, he sailed for Judea, there seeking to restore Jerusalem as a proper civilized Roman city, renaming it Aelia Capitolina, in honor of both him and Jupiter, ordering a temple in his honor to be built, later banning the barbaric practice of circumcision, which all combined to really trigger the Jews a lot. By then, Antinous had come to mean much to Hadrian. It was the truest form of love there was, that of a cum slut to their master. They even traveled to Egypt, visiting the pyramids and sphinx as a rich couple in love does. Nevertheless, Antinous was still beset with one great terror, fearing when Hadrian would abandon him for a woman. Little did he know that Hadrian wasn't bisexual. He detested woman, like his wife, but Antinous was still driven to depression over it. And as Hadrian was resting by the shore of the Nile, the dead corpse of Antinous floated nearby. The emperor was heartbroken. Drowned in sorrow, he secluded himself into absolute isolation, suffering waves of sadness, grief, and lots, lots of anger. That's creepy, Meanwhile, yeah. the Jews were at it again, oh, about no. to throw Here it yet comes. another revolt. Led by the proclaimed Messiah Bar Kokhba, he promised to retake Judea by any means necessary. He gathered his fanatical Jews, slaughtered the local Roman garrisons, and retook Jerusalem for themselves. When the local legions tried to restore peace, they were pushed back by half a million rebel Jews. Bakokba purged Judea of all non Jews, Romans and Christians alike, along with their wives and children. When news of the massacre reached the emperor, Adrian went. Mad. He sailed for Judea, followed by 12 legions, and started killing every single Jew he found. No mercy was shown, no quarter given. Hadrian would settle with nothing less than the complete destruction of Judea.
Nobody puts music like this when talking about some kind of genocide or some tragedy like this. <laughs> this channel is awesome. He wiped the name of the map and replaced Syria Palestine. Okay. So Hadrian did that, huh? Name Judea Syria Palestine. Is there any religious group that has been screwed over the years so much than Jews? I mean, god damn, in Egypt, in here in Rome, later, you know, lots of Christians, uh, that then even Hitler, like, I'm gonna have some of that, and in, invaded Warsaw and killed millions of them, concentration camp, and man, there are what, 15 million Jews left in the world out of what, 6, 7 billion population? How many Jews were killed, man? Damn, that's ridiculous. Everybody hates on Jews, apparently. Egyptians, Romans, Christians. May his bones be crushed. I already For missed skin suffers, blood. <laughs> but as history often teaches us, discounting your rage on the Jews can only get you so far. The truth was, after two decades ruling the empire, Hadrian had grown old and tired. His heart was kindled somewhat after an astrologer told him of a falling star, claiming it was proof of Antinous's divinity. He would from here on be worshipped as the god Astrologer talking about divinity, really? Okay. God of twink beauty. But all came to a head when Hadrian finished the Temple of Venus, building it to please his hero, Apollodorus, asking him for criticism. But just after he did so, he died leaving Hadrian with no heroes in this already loveless, familyless, friendless world he lived in. As death neared the emperor, Hadrian was consumed by the issue of succession. His only male relative... Damn, so most, most successful people of today, most celebrities of today, just like that, Hadrian was also, you know, was covered with depression. That's the case with most people today. Lots, most of Hollywood, most of celebrities are suffering from depression. It doesn't matter what success they get, there's always something missing. Clinical depression is a massive thing today. Lots of people suffer from it bit here and there. So Hadrian was also suffering from that apparently. Old enough to take over was Fuscus, his nephew, guarded by Sir Vienus, a barely civilized Iberian. But Fuscus had proven himself to be nothing but a hedonist degenerate, so Hadrian refused to make him his heir, for the good of the empire. But said good wasn't in the mind of the claimants, whom, in their rage, attempted to overthrow Hadrian, only to get absolutely trashed and sentenced to death. Before he died, Servianus threw an Iberian curse on Hadrian, dooming him to beg for death, but be unable to die. With their deaths, all hope to prevent another civil war seemed to be lost, which was when Hadrian met him. The great-great-great-nephew of Trajan, a young genius of a supremely gifted intellect, unparalleled virtue, and the fullest admiration for honor and duty. From that day on, Marcus became the solution to the emperor's problems. But not quite. While absolutely perfect in every way, Marcus was still too young. So to serve as a stopgap, Hadrian got a man named Lucius Caionus Commodus to adopt as his heir. Is that him? He died of tuberculosis. Oh, that yep, can be. Leaving his son Lucius Verus behind as well. But no problem, because Hadrian adopted one of the few virtuous senators still left, Titus Aurelius Antoninus to take his place. It wasn't that simple. Hadrian offered the adoption, and Antoninus, wondering if he was worthy enough, needed a few days to consider. But he came around to it, the conditions for the adoption being that he would in turn adopt Marcus, then named Marcus Aurelius, whom was made to marry Antoninus's daughter Faustina, with whom, despite hating sex, he had 13 children with, fulfilling his duty as a husband. Antoninus was also made to adopt Lucius Varus as well, because why not, he was a cool guy, as we'll see. And with the succession settled, Hadrian finally allowed himself to start dying. Such was his agony in his last days that he ordered several men to kill him, 
but so strong was the aura of respect he had built around him, his slaves just kept killing themselves to not disobey him. Damn. Antoninus then took care of him. Getting rid of any knives, Hadrian kept sneaking into the room, until the emperor, after so much begging, finally died. That's horrible, man. What the hell? Sometimes it's a mercy to, you know, let them go. Lots of countries are doing that. Canada and lots of countries are doing that. I mean, this is Roman times. I mean, people were dying left and right. And they, he was begging for to die because he was in such pain. And they were just, you know, taking all the weapons away. They were literally torturing him, man. What the hell? Leaving Antoninus to continue the dynasty that would be named after him. And he did absolutely nothing for 23 years. Based. Well, he did order the deification of Hadrian against the Senate. Well, Hadrian just literally massacred every Jew he can find of. So obviously Jews are not going to revolt now, they must be immensely scared. Every other tribe saw what he did to Jews, so they, they are just going like, you know what, people just chill out. So of course there's going to be two decades of peace, nobody's gonna revolt now. Wishes, gaining him the title Pious, the Dutiful. But things generally just happened around him. Like when the legions pushed north and built the Antonine Wall. Slaves were given more rights, out of mercy, Roman representatives were sent to China through the Indian Ocean, all while he remained in Italy, never leaving it, not once. Oh, and that time when the new king of Parthia, Vologosius IV, reunited his shithole kingdom and threatened to invade. So Antoninus just sent him a letter, saying, encroachment on Roman territory would not be taken lightly, which was enough to make Vologosius back down. But having reached his late 70s, Antoninus, after cursing out to the Parthians for daring to disrupt Roman imperial order, succumbed to old age, dying in his bed, leaving the empire to the greatest Roman alive at the time, him and his adoptive brother. The Nerva Antonine dynasty, so far, had been blessed with great emperors, and Marcus Aurelius was no exception. Unfortunately, in the first year of his reign, he would be faced with a monumental tragedy. Faustina, after birthing many kids, such as Lucilla, had given birth to twins, one of which died soon after birth. But that was not it. The real tragedy was that the youngest twin, a boy named Commodus, survived. There he comes. The hard truth was that the greatness that defined the Trojans and early Romans had been fading for centuries, becoming ever rarer. More and more, great men gave birth to weak fools. Marcus Aurelius could feel that dark times were ahead for the empire. From time immemorial, the patrician Aurelianus clan had been entrusted with the cult of Sol, the solar god of victory. As the newest member of the clan, Marcus embraced his duty. Having been boosted through the Crucis Honorum by Hadrian, being taught by the wisest man of his time, and reading the works of Stoics such as Seneca, Marcus Aurelius grew to be by far the wisest emperor to have ever lived. After Antoninus's death, the Senate sought to betray Hadrian's last wishes, and proclaim only Marcus the Princeps, but he shunned their efforts, demanding that equal power was granted to Lucius, as had been wished by his adoptive grandfather. The senators, as always, relented, and thus... Well, when a guy is, you know, well-read, knowledgeable, lit literate, uh, philosopher, emperor, apparently, so of course he's gonna be smart. He's gonna be, you know, honorable, I guess. So of course he's gonna not betray what he promised. So of course he's gonna make sure that there are two emperors. Usually backstabbing and, you know, power-hungry thing happens with, uh, you know, less literate people. Marcus and Lucius became the first co-emperors to rule Rome, after just finishing a joint consulship, so that's neat. Next, the co-emperors had to deal with the ever-corrupting Praetorian Guard, drowning them with bribes, to Marcus' disgust. And once Vologasius heard that They've been nothing but trouble, why not just have them killed? Antoninus was dead, he went ahead with his invasion, ransacking the east, taking over Armenia, etc, etc. To counter their aggression, Marcus was forced to relocate several Danubian legions to the east, appointing Varus to lead them against Parthia. He then meandered around for about a year, arrived in Antioch, and began partying, playing, and fucking non-stop. 
while delegating highly skilled legates such as Pertinax and Avidius Cassius to crush the Eastern Barbarians in his name. Which they did, not only retaking Armenia with ease, but beating the Parthians all the way back to the capital and burning it to the ground. Vologasius then sued for peace with Varus, whom, after marrying Marcus's daughter Lucilla, demanded the annexation of Portland. Why are they constantly attacking Rome by every single time the Romans arrive they get fucked over and over again? Haven't they learned their lessons like enough of this, let's chill out? ...of Armenia and Mesopotamia, naming himself Parthicus Mediacus Maximus. Both emperors then celebrated a triumph, Varus out of joy, and Marcus out of necessity. But hurt beyond belief, Vologostius called upon a terrible curse on the world, using his own eastern black magic to wish for the deaths of millions in a pitiful display of rage. The result was the Antonine Plague, a smallpox epidemic that would indeed kill millions of innocent Romans Damn, and that's soldiers tons of people. Another terrible consequence of the war was that now that the Danube was mostly demilitarized, the Germans saw their opportunity to strike. One of the biggest Germanic tribes were the Marcomanni, led by the barbarian king Balomar. Seeking to destroy civilization once and for all, Belomar promised to bring forth the chaos and destruction the Germans always desired, uniting the, the okay. tribes under a single Germanic confederation, including the Quadi, the Chatti, the migrating Yazigi nomads, and the evilest of them all, the Vandals. Starting the Marcomannic Wars, the Chatti invaded both provinces of Raetia and Germania Superior, getting beaten back by the Rhine legions. The Germans then focused on the Danube, invading Pannonia and also getting beaten back by the legions. The local governor even summoned the tribal leaders to answer for their aggression. Being led by Palomar, they promised to leave the empire peacefully. The governor was persuaded to trust them, letting them go. And when he returned to governance, Palomar invaded again and killed him. If there is a lesson to be learned here, I already taught it. In the same year, the Vandals you. and Yazigis <laughs> invaded Dacia, killing its governor and later pillaging Moesia. Call to action once more, both Marcus and Lucius prepared to march north and save the Empire, only for Virus to contract the Antonine Plague and suddenly die. Marcus mourned his adopted brother's death, taking responsibility for his family. For better or worse, Marcus was now the sole emperor. Leading the Roman response, Marcus liberated the provinces of Dacia and Boeotia, but to his back, the Germans invaded again, using the Roman roads to ransack Pannonia all the way to the Balkans. It was through these roads that Balomar also invaded, overwhelming the legions with his hordes and taking over Noricum, pillaging his way south into Italy and laying siege to Aquileia. But being too uncivilized to possess any siege weapons, Aquileia held long enough for Marcus to march west, pushing Balomar back north. Marcus set pursuit, crossing the Danube and raining retaliation on the Germans so hard that both the Yazigis and Quadai broke off the confederation. Damn. At the same time, a Hispanic legate challenged a Germanic king to single combat, defeating him with ease, and kicking his entire tribe out of the coalition as well. And so, Marcus sang praises of Maximus, and made him one of his top legates. And then suddenly, the Quadi betrayed their word, rejoining the confederation, alongside the- Is that Maximus as in the gladiator guy? That Maximus? Huh. Yes, it is. By that point, Marcus had reached the same conclusion Germanicus once did. Only the complete extermination of the Germanic hordes would ensure peace. His mind made up, Marcus sent all of his legates to purge the forests, including ones like Pescinius Niger and Clodius Albinus. And during the night, he put his philosophical brilliance to the paper, producing the Meditations, the ultimate guide for living a virtuous, stoic life. As the war raged, the gods joined on Rome's side, striking bolts on barbarians during sieges and starting rainstorms when the legions ran short on water. Getting beaten to a bloody pulp, both the Quadra and Yazigis surrendered to Marcus, Rio this time. And with this great victory at hand, the entire East rose in revolt. Yeah, remember Avidius Cassius? He had been in correspondence with the Empress, and with her melodramatic waning, it seemed like Marcus was about to die. Fearing a civil war, Avidius Cassius proclaimed himself emperor to prevent a power vacuum. Thing is, Marcus was still alive, but before he could do anything, the Senate declared his old friend an enemy of the state. Avidius Cassius was then Damn. murdered by one of his centurions, and Marcus refused to see the body. After crushing the last remnants of the Germanic hordes, it became clear the emperor was indeed nearing his death. Despite old and weak, Marcus saw that the purged German lands were annexed into the provinces of Marcomania and Sarmatia, and finally, it was time to revise his succession. 
having called upon Maximus to his tent, he adopted him as his heir. And fearing the rise of incompetent emperors in the future, he entrusted Maximus to restore the Republic, and cleanse Rome of the corruption that had crippled it long ago. As he went to inform Commodus of his choice, bitter and lusting for power, he had Marcus suffocated, killing his own father. He then lied about Marcus dying of natural causes, securing the support of the legions, except Maximus, and declaring himself the new emperor. <laughs> the second century is often remembered as Rome's golden age. Let's just define. Anyhow, it's thanks to Commodus why we are now saying goodbye to it. After ordering the death of Maximus and hearing that he escaped, Commodus ordered the death of his entire family. It is that Maximus from the Gladiator movie, that guy, huh? Back in Hispania. Right after, he ordered the abandonment of his father's conquests, letting the germs go without punishment so he could return Rome and be a hedonist degenerate. And that's exactly what he did, being such a shit emperor that he already began being conspired against. To counter this, Commodus ran a massive purge of the Senate. The good, competent senator still left, that is, filling the Senate with even more incompetent fools, spending his days making everyone's lives miserable, including Pertinax, Salvius Julianus, remember that last name, and a competent provincial governor named Septimius Severus. And Severus is not a man you make angry. And while the empire drowned in revolts, Commodus lapped as Hercules reborn, wielding a giant barbarian club to torture empty war veterans and crush midgets in the Colosseum. It was left to Pertinax to actually crush the revolts, alongside Piscinius Niger, the last one remaining being by Clodius Albinus in Britannia, but it was never resolved. To glorify his newly named senate, Commodus named 25 worthless men to serve as consuls in the same year, among them Septimius Severus, and he was not having it. And as yet another great fire broke out in Rome, Commodus was busy renaming the city as Colonia Lucia Enia Commodia, oh my the God. Romans as the Commodians, and every single month of the year named after his 12 self-given titles. Lucius, Aelius, Aurelius, Commodus, Augustus, Herculeus, Romanus, Exuperatorius, Amazonius, Invictus, Felix, Pius. And to celebrate, Commodus ordered the reenactment of the Battle of Zema on the Colosseum. But the Punic gladiators were well led, winning the match. Commodus then came down to congratulate the winner, whom then revealed himself as Maximus, vowing revenge for his emperor's and family's deaths. After failing to have Maximus die in the arena, he threatened his own nephew's life to his sister, forcing her to reveal another plot against him. After all his friends were killed, Maximus was imprisoned and set to fight Commodus in a match, being stabbed beforehand to ensure his death. Mortally wounded, Maximus was thrown into the Colosseum to fight Commodus, true emperor versus pathetic larper. Maximus quickly gained the advantage, despite increasingly losing consciousness. Commodus then attacked with a hidden dagger, being countered and stabbed to death with it. Having avenged his loved ones, Maximus relayed Marcus's wish to restore the Republic, then giving in to his injuries. As Damn. Lucilla arrived, it was too late. Maximus was dead. And the movie Gladiator. Rome's golden age has ended. Its best days forever gone. Pax Romana ended. While the glory of the past may be lost, its memory will live on. For there once was a dream. A dream called Rome. God damn, that was deep the way he said it. Oh. Man, I could not give two rats ass about Rome, but the way all this episode has been going, uh, this is 12th episode, the 12th 12 episode I watched, and this last thing about, it really hit me, man. Like, damn, man, now Rome is gonna decline. <laughs> it, it, have you seen some movie that you invested in so much that by the end some event happened, you're actually sad? That's what I'm feeling right now. That was a dream, a dream called Rome, and that just hit me, man. Uh, Commodus was such a shit emperor. That's a, that's so true, man. You can even see in the movie Gladiator. That's just <sighs> the five good emperors. Episode over. Pax Romana over. 
and now the future is just bad seven dynasty oh <laughs> i see what's going to happen now okay then crisis of the third century diocletian's treachery constantine the great imperial wrath barbarians at the great the barbarians at the gates and the fall of rome there are still seven episodes left so we are nowhere near the end but yeah man this was a good episode this was a really good episode i think so far the worst episode for me was the mad emperors only because there was so much going on people are coming and going people are coming and going it's like god damn it's hard to keep track of the last episode was good enough and this was also good trajan trajan was a monster wasn't he he was really dominant i didn't see that coming i didn't know anyone could be at that level all right people if you like my reaction don't forget to like and subscribe and show your support i'll see you next time